everyone, Lewis here, and welcome to my my series of non-documentary interviews, with the first being of me interviewing Trina Mason, also known as Trina the Mermaid. If you like this video, please hit the like button. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell for alerts of when I upload new content to the channel, especially those with disabilities similar to mine. In my interview with, with Trina, we talk about things like mermaiding, free and scuba diving, and wrestling, which of course, Trina is a professional mermaid performer, as well as a free diver and scuba diver, and a wrestler. And of course, she also interviews me as part of her series over on her YouTube channel, and I'll be sure to post the links to both the interview she did with me and her YouTube channel and other social media handles in the description below. I'm here with the with the amazing Trina Mason, <laughs> where she's known for her underwater content as a scuba diver, a mermaid, and other amazing and cool things. Thank you, Lewis. All right, Trina. Um, I'm going to ask you these questions. How did you become a scuba diver, and why did you want? And what made you want to be a diver? Okay, so when I was little, um, I literally learned to drive a boat before I learned to drive a car. Um, my dad always was a diver, and I remember particularly one year we went to the Florida Keys. We used to always go camping at this place called John Penny Camp, which I heard things changed and it's not like the same anymore, but I actually learned to scuba dive by playing around with like a little tiny baby scuba tank inside um, the bottom of their pool. I actually took a video of me taking like my first breath, uh, the first time I ever did that. And then once like I got to test it out and play around a little bit in the bottom of the pool with my dad's supervision and my brother's supervision, I realized like this is what I want to do. And then um, I took the first part of Patty online. And like once I did the math part, which for me was kind of like the hardest, I don't know if that's like a spectrum thing or I don't really know which yeah. brain how to Yeah, um I like in regards to that, it wasn't easy for me to get certified. Let me tell you this. Yeah. Because in 2006, I tried to get certified through now two times. I just couldn't pass the written test. I did go with the water skills, but just not the written test though. And yeah. I was able to learn how to do stride jump because of learning how to, yeah, giant strides because I learned how to do do it while training to become a lifeguard, which that also took me four times too. But that's for another, that's enough. We can talk about that later. But your now, love for the water is just amazing how you didn't give up. You know, a lot of people would get really discouraged because they failed a couple times and you didn't let that stop you, you know? But it, yeah, then I went with, with a local dive shop. Yeah, because the dive shop I tried to get certified through that are associated with Naui, they are called Underwater World up in um, up in Abington, up in Willow Grove, in the suburbs here in Philadelphia. But of course, then, then I went down to this dive shop called Blue Horizons. They used to be located down in South Philadelphia, but then they moved out to the suburbs. I did fail their written test once, but then I came back, retook it, and then I passed. But of course, when, when it came time to do my actual open water dives, things went wrong with me because I had a weight belt and it would, it would slip off of me. And then I accidentally went down to 60 feet during my second dive, my third dive. It was actually my third dive. And I also had struggled with uh, my, my water with water getting in my mask. Yeah, and equalizing all that, right? No, 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 not equalizing, just the water in my mask. Oh, that, that part? Yeah, but it, I was able to still pass, but I was, but I went, I was also still struggling with my buoyancy, my air consumption at the time. And then I stopped from, from, from there up until 2015. It took me nine years to get back to diving because I did only four dives at the time. Wow. Which, but, which of course I went to to Disney World to Epcot in 2015. That was the first time. That was one year before I did my very first trip with Dive Park. And of course, ever since I've accumulated about 
123 dies. But I did have another hiatus, mainly because of the pandemic, though. Because when I went diving up at Dutch Springs back in the fall, what happened was, you know, my buoyancy and my air consumption wasn't the same, mainly because of being out for a, for a year. I'm trying to get that back because I'm actually in the process of working on getting back into the aquarium to, to, to do my volunteer diving two times a month there. You saying certain things um, are just like inspiring me so much. Like you made me remember, like I got certified at a place called Tarpoon Lagoon and it was a place that you could get certified in two days, um, but you had to do the online patty stuff. And well, yeah, there is it, was, it was actually actual classwork, classroom work. I had to, um, I had to do it. I had to do it. I had to do classroom work in two days, including the written tests and, and of course, two days of being in the pool. And then the following weekend, we did the actual open water dives. I bet it would have been cool to take a class like in person like that because online was a little bit hard to focus. And yeah, the buoyancy maps or like the math part of figuring out how long you need to stay underwater um, before coming to the top was a little bit hard. And like yeah. on my second dive, I had to do I had to do what you talked about. Like I had, they made us take off our mask underwater and put it back on while underwater. That was part of the test. And also we had to dive down 60 feet. And I'll never forget like what it was like when you first go down and you're just looking up. It's like one of the most majestic things. And I was very lucky because my dad came with me. He was allowed to come on my final dive trip. So like on my final certification thing, my dad came with me. And I always remember like when they took my picture, like I had all this sunburn and stuff like that. But I ended up really like actually diving. Wait, was he diving alongside you? Yeah. It was really cool for the last who time. Certified? So who, I never got to ask, but who, who which agency are you all you, your father and your brother are certified through? I don't know who my brother and my dad are certified through, but I got certified through Patty. I'm also a Patty Diver too. Cool. Yeah, I, I'm really happy with it. Um, I was going to say something cheesy, like uh, normally I have a hard time or like self image, if you can, issues. And like I normally don't like my picture on IDs, but my scuba diving ID ended up being like the best, coolest picture <laughs> of me ever. Like my hair was all like ocean hair and like my face was red from diving and sunburn. I've, yeah. I've seen a lot of your diving videos and it's kind of cool that you've been to to Devil's Den, yeah. um, Guinea Springs, is, or is that the name Guinea of it? Springs is cool, but I haven't scuba dived there. It's thanks to my friend Dallas that I got to go to Devil's Den. He was the first one to take me there. I had seen it in dive magazines with my dad and I always wanted to go. And you also um, said something else that got me excited is... Um, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting again, but it was something else that you said that made me be like, oh my God, me too, that I went through that, but um, it'll come back if it's important. Yeah, I always wanted to dive Devil's Den because I even known other people I met on Facebook through the dive community. And of course, oh, I, I remember, Louis, um, you know how you're talking about how you took up a lot of oxygen and used up your tank really quickly? Um, I recently flew to Florida and I brought my autism awareness mermaid tail because it's the first time that I had like hair and I played with it in a long time. And we made jokes how I was like a little bit rusty because I was having a hard time, like <laughs> trying to breathe and swim with the tail on. And I got like really excited. So I used up too much energy and I identified- Would you actually scuba dive in your tail? Huh? Would you actually scuba dive in your tail? No, I was just like free diving, swimming around but I hadn't been in my tail for like a year. So like, it was really big exercise and I was like super excited and I was having a hard time like calming down, you know, because I was like super stimming in the water. <laughs> what, are you, what, yeah. are you, what kind of tails do you have? You have silicone, you have um, scuba net or spandex? I have two tails left. And honestly, I'm thinking about selling them both and getting a new tail. Um, one of them is a uh, neoprene with silicone on top. And the other one is a full uh, mer tailor tail. But to be honest, I it was a really, really expensive full silicone tail. And it's fairly used. So I don't know if I can get the $4,000 that was originally spent on it. But it I, just love nice. tailor. I love mer tailor because I'm thinking about eventually getting the same pattern that I have for my tail, but in a scuba knit form. 
I haven't seen the scuba net form one yet. It's called, I'll tell you what my pattern is called. It's called Caribbean Dream. Which of course is also my leggings too, as you see here. It sounds like we should get you that tail for your trip to Mexico. Yeah, that would definitely be nice. But of course, I also got to mention, I lost my job because of the pandemic and I'm trying to, you know, find a new job and, you know. You were a lifeguard, right? Yeah, and now, before I move on to the next question, yeah, about me being a lifeguard, well, I kind of got influenced by the people at, at the pool I, I would occasionally go to when visiting my ex when we were still dating. It took me, I'll tell you, I, I pretty much struggled with, 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 with the water test, you know, with, with getting the brick from the bottom. I failed the written test. I just wasn't prepared. I didn't know how to swim laps. But of course, the second try, I swam. And, but I still failed the brick test, but I passed it. But the, but the water test and the brick test, the, the brick test I got better with, but it was mainly the brick test that was my main pet peeve. It you say written ready. test, just to confirm, you said the written test was your pet peeve? Yes, and, and originally the water skills, but as I practiced and practiced, yeah, from, from throughout all of 2004 up until early 2005, which, of course, after after my 21st birthday was when I finally got certified to die. I mean, not, not, I mean, not die, to be a lifeguard. I said I got certified to die when I was 22. So you're a lifeguard first, then? Exactly. But of course, I did eventually lose my position as a lifeguard after failing to get certified through the WISE now long discontinued program, which was a crossover. And then, then the Y, the Y dropped that though. I mean, I mean, I, as a professional merman, I like to eventually get become a lifeguard, but not to work as one, but just to have it though. Yeah, I, I also have always wanted to like learn. Uh, that stuff, you know, it is a lot of responsibility and scary. And like you, I don't know that I can take a job. I only had it. one rescue in my life, though, but it didn't have a drowning either, thank goodness. Yeah. But based on experience, it's no Baywatch. You have to watch <laughs> the pool at all times. You can't be distracted. You can't have phones on deck yeah. because ever the one of the rules of the Y and any aquatic facility, you have you, you use your phone while you're on the job, you get fired. That, that never happened to me. You know, um, since you're talking on the subject of the why, I want to say something that's a little controversial. Um, I have a friend who is deaf, and I recently found out that the why will not hire anyone who's deaf. Yeah, the why is so controversial. Yeah, they are. Because after I, after I was stripped of my lifeguard position, I was reduced to doing maintenance around the pool, and then, and then I ended up becoming a child uh, swim instructors aid you know with children little kid little preschool age children and then and then three years ago in 2019 when when the then new aquatics director came she decided to discontinue that and then I was forced to go back to what I did you know before I did that and then then the pandemic struck, and then I'm out of a job that's pretty much what happened what if we made you a GoFundMe for your Mer Taylor tale for um, going to Mexico? That would be a good idea. You you can you can do that if you want, Trina. Feel free to yeah yeah, yeah you can you definitely can feel free. I can I can help with it. I would want you to set it up so that way the money goes all directly to you. But I can help like figure out the math, like maybe put the Mer Taylor tale in our cart and figure out how much it would cost to ship it and find out to the decimal how much it would cost. Well, I'd, have to get a, I'd have to get it here first. I'd have to get it here to Philly. And the okay. reason why I bought the guppy was just because I'm a beginner. And I still need more time in my my mer tail, my, my guppy first, which is a beginner tail, which yeah. the monofin is a mermaid linden. You ever heard of her? Uh, mermaid linden monofin? Yeah. You ever heard of that? Yeah, I've actually heard of linden. Isn't she like a professional free diver? And yeah. the, she's... She's a, she's a patty scuba diver and she's also a professional mermaid. And I was also going to ask you, move on to question two, since you brought that up. How, what made you want to become a mermaid? Huh. Okay, and so. And have you ever entertained children as a mermaid? 
Oh, I love to answer this question. So when I was younger, I had an underwater camera and I used to just be really silly, like, like, you know, blowing bubbles. And I, I actually got a lot of views on my channel. Surprisingly, I didn't understand how many people were like me. And I met a friend through YouTube who is also on the spectrum and he's from Canada. And he told me that Mirbella was selling a tail and um, that I should become a mermaid. And I had a photographer at the time reach out to her and handle um, the business side of it, of sealing the purchase. And I had um, like paid him the money so that he could get it for me. And then when we got the tail, it was a neoprene tail. And then I realized I really wanted to do that. So I took um, oh. money I made from the modeling world and um, it was a really expensive purchase. Like I basically wanted to get all the kind of work that I was in before, as I told you before, and I took the money that I had saved up, it was $2,650 or something like that, or 280, 2000 and something dollars for this professional, uh, the parrot fish tail, that's like my famous signature tail. And then um, once I got that tail, I actually did get to do a lot of birthday parties. And I got to work for Ripley's Believe It or Not. And I got to work for this uh, like famous hotel called the Ritz Carlton. And that was probably my favorite job because they had me work this storyline where I'm princess augustina about like because that's in saint augustine or amelia island and that i would tell stories to the kids and i remember loving it so much because you know a lot of kids they go through a lot of stuff at home so when you get to be a professional mermaid you kind of get to get the kids to get lost in the fantasy of like this is real and uh the other favorite part that i really liked is um i remember one little girl she had such a unique brain she, i remember she asked me questions like um <laughs> she was like are there jail cells underneath in the ocean <laughs> like do mermaids have prisons and I just thought it was so unique the way that she thought and then I would have like little kids pick on me they would be like you're not real you have makeup or you have nail polish and like they would like pull my hair or try to pull on my shell bra and try to like prove that I was uh, so. they're just kids they're just kids being kids but at the same time gotta learn boundaries and speaking of kids yeah um because when I was at the Adventure Aquarium last Sunday, when I was there to meet the mermaids, I actually met some kids and their parents and told them about me being a merman. And there was this one reaction from this one little girl when I showed her a picture of me and my tail from my Mersona. And she said, oh my gosh, no words. She never seen a merman until <laughs> recently. Because in my honest opinion, I think children would love mermen just as much as they would love mermaids. Since you're on that topic, I'll tell you the dream I had when I was young. When I was young and I first started this business, I wanted to do both to have the man, the merman and the mermaid, and then perform at aquariums from that perspective of seeing both sexes of fish kind of thing. And then like, um, you know, just kind of like, uh, you could say like being real, like the real mermaid, not using scuba hoses, you know, professional free divers who could hold their breath. And like being able to do certain performances, right? Like you might have seen like Mermaid Melissa, for example, she does the blow kiss really good, like like a big bubble and just like hits the wall. I heard of her. And speaking of that though, since yeah, because the wands and wishes, because some of the mermaids from Wands and Wishes have even said there's a need for more mermen in the community. And of course, I would definitely be down to, to I only know the five, Lewis. I only know five mermen. Yeah, there's probably way more, but I only really know five. I, six, I know six Merman actually. Christian. Yeah, I know Merman. Oh Christian. yeah, Merman Christian. Okay, then there's seven. I mean, I'd have to really think about it, and I don't know um, all of their names. Like I kind of know their faces. I can't. Maybe it's Jazz. I forgot. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, I think I've Maybe heard of Jax. Maybe it's Jax. Yeah, I believe I've heard of Merman Jax. I've heard of him. Now, as for perf Merman performing at aquariums. I think maybe it's time that get that changes because because I'm friends with some of the wands and wishes girls, not just on Instagram, but some on Facebook too, because one of them recently became a die hard adaptive buddy herself. And she told me that about mermen being able to, you know, willing to do appearances. And I'm willing, I told her I'm I'm a merman who's willing to do appearances. And that she says that diving without a mask is different than diving with one because you have to, you know, be underwater. For 30 minutes while using scuba while you're in your tail yeah. and of course when i'm around children 
I prefer to protect the magic, keep the secret. Yeah, you know, kind of like H2O and Mako Mermaids, where you have to keep the existence of Merfolk secret. Yeah, and the moon pool if you discover it. I love that part of the whole show, dude. The moon pool is the best part. Yes, and I and fun fact, I even written some fan fiction. I've written one called Mako Adventure and a sequel called Mako Adventure Two, which of course features myself and my friend. Of course, I'll she. I'll just call her Jesse Fredlin. Uh, that's who she is. Or she's also Mermaid Moral Opal on Instagram. And she also calls herself Kiai Hime 94. I like yeah. that name. But our but our fictional counterparts in the story are named Jennifer and Mark. And yes, I also the fun thing about this story is I also include me, my autistic characteristics to my fictional character. Cool. We're the main protagonist, and we do interact with every single H2O and Mako Mermaid's character in, in, in my crossover. And of course, one of my powers is the ability to teleport anywhere. And then eventually, yeah, I've written these fan fictions on, I've written these fan fictions on Wattpad. I've never heard of that before. Yeah. Yeah. Jesse introduced me to that. Yeah, it's it's a great place for, you know, wanting to publish books and get paid or just writing fun fan fictions. So it's and a place where you can see the things that you've written. It's like public? Yeah, public. I'll, I'll send you the link to that later. And, and of course, yeah, yeah, anyone can join. Anyone can sign up. I, and you know, and of course, one of the the sequel, Mako Adventure Two, which of course takes place shortly after the first story, the secret of Merfolk, you know, it no longer has to be kept a secret because Merfolk and normal plan people can interact with each other and live in harmony. But though there's some discrimination too, and some of the locations I include in both stories include, though the majority of the story is set in mainly Australia like in both shows, part of it, the part, some, some, some chapters are set here in my hometown of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Others are set in China, which of course, there is an Eastern pod. That's just a brief trip to China. Okinawa, yeah, I mean, the Izu Islands in Japan is also mentioned. Of course, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, those are just some of the places we go to. And of course, you know, are you into sports, um, Trina? Uh, only like professional wrestling. And um, yeah, I mean, other not than baseball, that. Not baseball, because some famous baseball players are in my story too. Cool. One of them, one of them is Bryce Harper, who used to be with the Washington Nationals and now with the Phillies. He and his family become merfolk after after accidentally getting into the moon pool. And then, <laughs> and of course, and then there's former baseball player, Hunter Pence, who's secretly a wizard. Have you ever seen the movie Stranger Than Fiction? No, I haven't. But of course, the creators of H2O and Mako Mermaids also created this show called The Bureau of Magical Things, which is, which of course, merfolk also do appear in there, but they don't have as much of a, huge significance as they do in H2O or Mako Mermaids. I kind of like how you talked about um, the discrimination part. Um, that's something that I kind of grew to kind of like that they actually include that part of the psychology. Like I was watching this TV show called, um, honestly, Airbender, like the new one, Korra. Um, I don't know if you got into that. But you, mean, you, mean, like, you mean the sequel to Avatar, The Last Airbender? Yeah, the one with his granddaughter. I'm not yeah. too into. I'm not in too much into to Avatar: The Last Airbender or Korra. I love The Last Airbender, so I try to watch the next one. But what I was gonna say about the show is they also do the discrimination thing in there, like benders versus like humans, and how they're like kind of hating on all the benders. So I can only imagine what the mermaid like one was like. You know, that's the only way that I could compare it to. Because some of the main antagonists in my story aren't just taken from the H2O and. Make, make all mermaids franchises 
some of the antagonists are based on people from my own from from real life who kind of are bullies. Of course, I'll get into subject of talking about bullying later. Uh, Louis, just so you know, my phone just gave me a 20% warning. So if you have any other questions or anything you'd yes. like to add into this call. Yes, um, yes, let's of course. I'm gonna, on that okay, the last, I die. okay, the last question is, how did you become a wrestler? Whew. So when I was like 16 years old, I shaved my head into a mohawk. And um, I had gone to say, say one more time. I see that, I've seen that on your profiles. Yeah, um, I was really into punk rock music, and I had a friend um, at the time who had a mohawk, and I always said that if I didn't have a boyfriend that I would do it, and one day me and that guy broke up and ended up getting a mohawk, but um, I ended up getting a mohawk, and I went to a wrestling show, and uh, the owner of the company, uh, Pro Wrestling Fusion, he asked me to hang up, hold up some cards and to be a ring girl, and he told me that I was meant to be a wrestler and that I have the look of a wrestler and that I should take it more seriously. And at the time, um, like I had just met this other person who I'll call John Beaver and John Beaver uh, and I, we met on the 4th of July and we like play fought wrestling in the pouring rain and like this mud at this place called Central Park. And we started hanging out more and even started dating at one point. And um, he started, he was into backyard wrestling. And then I was like, hey, dude, you should take this seriously and look into going to like a professional school because he was talking about that those existed. And at the time, I didn't know. And I went with him and I would watch. And um, when I was young, they actually wouldn't give me permission to do it because I was like 16, 17, you know, they, they wanted me to be 18. But I found, oh, um, yeah. yeah. I found Speaking another school though. There's this guy, he's a famous old WWE guy. His name was Rusty Brooks. And Rusty Brooks- I never heard to, of him. He used to do, he was just like, um, he's what uh, some jabronis would call a jobber. But uh, I'll leave that kayfabe stuff out. But basically, uh, um, he accepted me at his school, Rusty Brook School of Hard Knocks. And at the time, I was young. You know, I didn't drive. So I used to take the public bus. And he would pick me up at the bus stop. Yeah, I took the bus myself. And then uh, it, the rest is kind of history. I wrestled in the backyard with this guy, um, Max Stardom, who ended up going on to be kind of a star himself. And he taught me Sunset Flip and all these things. And I ended up just absolutely loving it. And continuing my training i originally was trying to train at the ccw school but at the time pablo marquez um said i was too young and wouldn't give me permission um but i think now the rules change like a parent sign waivers and stuff but the rest is pretty much history and then um i've been in and out you could say like i retired and kind of and i came back and um but it's the moment that started now. huh you're retired again uh, honestly, like, it's really easy to hurt yourself if you're working with people yeah. that don't know what they're doing kind of thing. Wrestling isn't for everyone. I couldn't be a wrestler if, even if I wanted to. I mean, because I had to give up all special needs cheer because I, especially because of the fact there were times I did hurt myself. And speaking of yeah. backyard wrestling, because one of my friends who I knew from high school, he actually used to do backyard wrestling oh. when he was 15. I love wrestling. Like, it it was so therapeutic for me to be in the ring. I like taking moves. I love giving moves. And I love the, like, there's like a history to it. And I kind of really love the classic professional wrestling. And I grew up with like a lot of like old schoolers people that were like really, really helpful to me. Um, like uh, Johnny Vandal, Craig Classic, and um, Chase Rance. Chase and Rance is a huge reason why he owns a company called I Believe in Wrestling out in, um, Orlando and I trained with him for a while and also um there's another guy um he's kind of well known um Teddy Hart he ended up taking me under his wing after um an accident you could say that happened at the Juggalo Championship uh wrestling event yeah that's uh, I I get so basically I had a match with this girl and um basically um I messed up you could say and she got mad at me and she spit on me in the middle of the ring. And it turns was out that this story girl, was that part of the, of the match, the story match. It absolutely was not part of uh, oh, anything she was, that so, I was expecting. So she really was angry at you. She was really, really, really mad and she spit on me. And uh, basically, it turns out that this girl, her ex-boyfriend was the infamous Teddy Hart. 
and Teddy Hart heard what happened to me. I'm basically like Stone Cold Steve Austin sometimes. Like uh, anyone that knows his history, like sometimes yeah, the whole I crowd. I used to watch Steve Austin. I used to watch Stone Cold Steve Austin. Dude, when he started, he used to, he had what I had, like where he goes deaf. Like I can't hear nothing sometimes when I'm in the ring. Like I'd like, I don't hear it. So like uh, that happened to me. And um, I went on to train with Teddy Hart. Thanks to that girl doing that. Like he ended up reaching out to me and being my trainer. And he's like one of the best submissive, like, su like training into submissions, you know, like really forcing people to tap out. He's really, really a great worker. He's also a great high flyer. And so for a while I would pick him up and drive him to the school in Orlando. I picked him up out of Tampa and I did that for like a couple months. And that was really cool. Um, basically that's considered paying your dues, you know, like um, helping them set up the ring, tear down the ring. Um, I did that for a while and actually found a lot of love and joy out of that. And uh, actually working for uh, the JCW, the Instant Clown Posse, that was the first time I ever had my official paid assignment. And that was always really cool to me because um, the whole story of that character coming to life um, we went, me and my dad went to go see my grandma in the retirement home and it was Christmas and my grandma forgot who I was. And I kind of was a big cry baby, like super cry baby. And my dad was trying to make, <laughs> my dad was trying to make light about the situation. He said, Trina, when are you going to wrestle again? And I said, Poppy, I'm never wrestling again, unless I'm the toxic butthole and I work for Juggalo Championship Wrestling. <laughs> and, and then six months later, Kevin Gill commissions me lets me come out gives me a chance to work this character that I created in my head which was basically like a Rikishi clown gimmick if you know who Rikishi is <laughs> I don't know who Rikishi is but I also <laughs> watch him along with The Rock yes I also am a huge fan of of Dwayne Johnson <laughs> The Rock though me the too me too wrestling. he's become a successful Rumble actor Rumble. yeah he's a great actor man I'm like in love with all of his work I also love all his charity stuff he does I really like grew to love him as a person totally on my bucket list to meet that guy man just give him a hug and a high five ah, that'd be so freaking cool I would like, love to meet the rock I would really would love to meet the rock and even Stone Cold Steve Austin one of these days <laughs> but of course I'm not into wrestling like I used to but I would love to meet them nonetheless they are de definitely two of my favorite WWE heroes including Hulk Hogan yep the, the late re the late Roddy Piper, ma the Macho Man Randy Savage, and even yeah, yeah, yeah. Those those what were my Rick favorite Flair? wrestlers growing up. Woo! Ric Flair. Because even I even had cousins. Even my cousins when we were just little kids used to watch them on TV. Yeah, my dad and I um, used to watch wrestling a lot together. So it was kind of funny that when I got like you know, old or whatever, like, because when I was nine and 13, we would go to the, the shows together. And back then, uh, they used to have like the divas and do like, kind of like, um, you could say like bikini contests and stuff like that at the shows. Of course, of course I know that m most of wrestling is, of course, I know the moves are real, but the only thing that's fake is mainly the storylines, though. I get it, because it's mainly just a character. In reality, I know that's but not, not always. Wrestling. So it's, it's, it's not really fair for people to say that, like, unless you've been in the business, you know, you don't really fully know, like, the background of things. So I don't really like when people try to say that or, like, when Ronda, Ronda Rousey try to come out and act like it was this or that, you know what I mean? Like, that, like I said earlier, like, there's a whole history to this form of art, you know, and maybe it's not taken so seriously anymore with the way the extreme storylines are now with like certain uh, major yeah. brand corporations. Uh, but there's some people that keep it like the classic traditional ways, especially in Japan. Japan is like known for like really being like, uh, yes. like old school, you could say. And, and speaking of wrestling, they made some good wrestling games called Aki Wrestling. Never heard but, of that. Yeah, because a friend of mine has actually reviewed the Aki Wrestling games on his YouTube channel. He's called Ali RX. And of course, some of those games have actually come here to the United States as WCW and WWE when they were the WWF games for PlayStation and Nintendo 64. Man, if anyone's ever interested in wrestling, I just always tell them just walk into your local, the, your local wrestling school. Most of the time you can find like it would be a professional wrestling training school, not just like a wrestling school because professional wrestling is like a whole separate uh, brand, you could say, of like this work. 
And then, and of course, I know the difference between professional rest, wrestling and high school and collegiate wrestling because because pretty much it's more than just grappling at all. Yeah, and certain things aren't allowed, and then some things are allowed that aren't normally allowed and stuff like that. I actually have gotten a laugh out of playing wrestling video games when I was younger. Like, I played some WWF, the old now WWE games on the Super Nintendo as a kid, like about Royal Rumble. I've never played any of the games before, but I had fans like make me into a wrestling character inside the game, and I thought that was kind of cool. Wow, that's interesting. You mean you actually had fans who have the actual WWE licensed games make make a digital avatar of you? Yeah, and like that's yeah. kind of cool. Yeah, I thought that was cool. Um, I, sometimes I don't like. I don't know if that's like uh like a spectrum thing or what, but sometimes like I just don't know how to respond to that. Like, part of me is like, that's it's cool. actually it's actually part of the feature where you can make a custom wrestler you, you could you could make make anyone into a wrestler so in other words it's not just you someone could i could i could make myself a wrestler in the game if i wanted oh, to cool. play it or i can make i can even make other fictional characters as wrestlers such as i would say, love if someone Power did Rangers, or even sonic or mario <laughs> etc anyone can be made into a wrestler for the wwe games i would like to customization made I would like if someone made like my new clown character one instead of making me like a sexy diva, like do my actual funny character, you know, um, which I decided I think I'm going to change the name because um, Shaggy Two Dope was doing the commentary for the wrestling ring and he he made a joke about my character and I thought about changing my name to that instead because um, it would just make a lot more sense and uh, it's you could say it's a nicer name than using the toxic V name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Of, cor of course, that's just where we end it now, only because, you know, you said your phone is low on power. Yes, sir. So we can end it right now. <laughs> yeah, and we course, can do this again if you want to as well. Yeah, we can do another interview another time because there's a lot of topics I want to talk about. No problem. You just let me know. We'll schedule it just like we did this time. Okay, Louis? Yes, because I definitely am willing to, to collaborate with you in the future. That'd be really nice. Don't forget to also send me a message on Facebook of the uh, Mexico Dive. Oh, yes. And, of course, everyone, thank you for watching. Take care and have a good day. Thank you, guys. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye. Ciao. I hope you all enjoyed this interview I did with, with Trina very sweet person and we talked about a lot of interesting things and of course again if you want to know how to give her a follow on all her platforms again the links to them will be in the description below in the meantime this is Lewis saying thanks for watching everyone you can also follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, and TikTok. Remember, it's time for adventure!